All right. So today we are going to talk about code isolation framework, a, a custom framework, but probably a problem that we are all familiar with. And certainly we are very much familiar with this problem in Microsoft, where there is there are a number of teams with different dynamic ownerships of business processes, et cetera. So what is this, uh, what is our agenda today first? Um, we'll first look at some of the techniques that we commonly use, which is pretty much familiar for everybody on enhancing some of the out of the box capabilities in SAP. So for example, if you have a sales order and you want to fine tune how the sales order is created in the system, obviously we go for a baddie or a user exit and things like that. Now there's a problem there and we'll discuss more about those problems or challenges, especially in a big organization or when there are multiple teams involved handling certain aspects of these, these exit points. Um, we'll then discuss a little bit more about tackling these challenges. Like what, what would be our, our uh, state that we would like to have for tackling these challenges? We'll then see what this code isolation framework is and how it helps us. It's a custom framework, but born out of some of the pain points and the problems that we observed when we are continuously working on these exit points, plus multiple teams at the same time, taking ownership of certain aspects of business. As Tobia said, there is a large SAP implementation uh, we heavily use SAP in Microsoft, and there are multiple business processes, sometimes very complex, because of which we have to route the execution of certain things to a certain team, and teams have ownership. All these different complex scenarios are there, and which then gave rise to the need for the teams to move fast without blocking each other. How does this code isolation framework help us? We'll see that. We'll also look into what the architecture or the internal workings are. We then will go into two demos. The first demo would be a pretty simple, straightforward uh, demo, which we will use to re-emphasize some of the concepts that we have discussed in, this, in, the, in the talk on the slides. And the second one, we would look into a little bit more complex demo where we isolate code and then we route it using the BADI technologies in SAP. So how does code isolation framework that we are talking about, what this thing is, how does it hand over gracefully to some of the standard out of the box SAP capabilities for code isolation, which eventually together provide us with a strong, robust uh, problem solving capabilities, the problem which we are going to discuss very soon here. So that's our agenda. So let's go ahead and then get started. So if we have a SAP, when we have an SAP system and complex business processes, SAP does its best with all its research to, to kind of uh, bring out of the box a lot of capabilities, right? Like, you know, be it a sales order creation, be it a dispute management, uh, be it any other business processes. However, SAP also knows that complex organizations does not always align with, <clears throat> uh, it cannot be a fit all scenario. There are, <clears throat> each organization has their own business processes to follow or distinct business processes. And hence there are exit points like user exits, baddies, implicit and explicit enhancements that we saw in the previous sessions and many other uh, techniques that we can use to enhance these the, the out-of-the-box capabilities from SAP. So far, so good. But there are certain challenges with this. So if we take a user exit or a baddie as it stands out from SAP or comes out from SAP, we are all familiar with MV45 AFZZ, a very familiar user exit for uh, uh, order creations and many other uh, situations. Now, that is a form, that is a routine, a subroutine. Now there is one object that include which where we go and put the code for say, for example, the user exit MV45 AFZZ. 
Now, here's where the problem starts. So let's say we have two distinct teams, both dealing with sales order, one team dealing with, say, sales order type A, A B, and another team dealing with sales order type uh, ZZ, for example. Two different sales order types, and the volumes uh, make it mandatory that there are certain owners, different owners for these sales orders and handlings and many other things. Um, so when the team AA, the team who is dealing with sales order AA, want to make some enhancements, want to make some, some changes, what would we do? We would go into this MV45 AFZZ, make the changes, save it, capture it in a transport, and then wait for uh, moving it into production after testing, all those kind of things. Now imagine that the team ZZ also want to make these changes, make some additional changes in their business process. So now we have a problem because that same object that we are talking about is captured in team AA's transport. Team ZZ, when we, when we attempt to go and modify that, it would either create a subtask inside the transport because the object is already captured, or the team CZ would be forced to wait for a period of time before they will be able to make that change and move it to production. Business changes fast, so the agility and speed is also of vital importance. Um, even if that is not the case, we would then rely on complex if-else scenarios, like you know, if uh, sales order type is say AA, then give control to AA or like, you know, execute these routines. And then if it sales order type is ZZ, then execute these routines. It now, it, you can see that it quickly, when, I mean, two is not a problem. What about 10, 15, 20 and different combinations? It can get complex really fast, these executions with if else conditions and things like that and becomes very complex and a nightmare to test. Now, coming to testing nightmares, the problem also is interrelated. So if the team AA, take sort of type AA, makes a change on this common routine, which is used by many people, it now becomes a mandatory thing to for all these different teams who is using this user exit to go and start testing it. Because if you have made a modification into a code that is hitting production for these different type, type, uh, types of sales orders, and if you change a variable, that potentially can affect somebody else as well. So there is interlocking. It doesn't, so that's where the problem begins. There is complexity in code and there is interdependency in testing. Now, as anybody knows, the in, in large organizations where multiple teams are working, um, and there is race against time all the time. Getting that lock in for coordination and, like, you know, testing coordination, all those kind of things becomes a very big challenge and hence affects our speed in which we are able to go live with new features and things like that. So, all these and many more problems start surfacing because the enhancement points are one specific object. And that object gets locked into certain transport and other ownerships and things like that. So what if we have a situation or a framework where which takes ownership of this exit point and then takes responsibility to route the execution into appropriate teams owned, say, let's say classes or areas. So in this scenario, a specific team, as we saw in our example earlier, team AA and team A, the ZZ, they won't be making modifications directly in the user exit. Rather, they will have their own dedicated classes, for example. And as far as the team is concerned, the execution flow, when say a sales order is getting created, will eventually reach their class. All they are worried about is to fo laser focus on their own class without worrying anything about how the execution reached there. 
Now, in theory, that's great, but there is still is the problem that we discussed earlier about, earlier about if else conditions, changes in business processes, uh, you know, changes in techniques, all those kind of things. So it's important that we are able to control this, this flow and this routing to the appropriate teams dynamically. And the way we do that in SAP is through configuration. So we need a robust configuration layer to, to get, get the, the routing control uh, uh, you know, appropriately. It needs to be fast and efficient. There's no point in having a framework if that framework itself is going to take a lot of time. And hence, dynamic programming or field symbols or memory programming, et cetera, now comes into the picture because <clears throat> uh, if you are copying variables from one place to another, it, it, it will cause delays and things like that. So it needs to be fast and efficient. And the, the handover control, the separate execution logics and handover control to distinct object need to be thorough, or we should be able to capture errors and things like that. Most importantly, in, our, in, in, in my experience at Microsoft, the, the biggest advantage is this frees the different teams interdependency. Interdependency and intermingling are pretty good. It's, it's very much needed, but when it becomes too much, it reduces the efficiency and that interdependency reduce the reduction of testing efforts and things like that is always a good thing because now the team AA has the ability to make changes to their own logic, move it to production without affecting or waiting on another completely different team TZ, team ZZ, because they are now working not on that common code point, but rather on their own islands or their own classes, which they would implement and move to production. With the assurance from the framework that we are going to talk about that as the sales order ZZ comes up, somehow the framework is going to deliver the execution flow till that starting point where their ownership, that team ZZ's ownership starts. So um, let's take a, a, a very high level view and then we will go into the system to uh, discuss a little bit more on how all this works and see a demo. Um, so at, at a very high level, we would name such points, such exit points, or any place where we would like to have the separation of logics, the separation of concerns, if you will. We would like to name that. And in our, uh, in our discussion, let's call it the separation point ID. So once we have named it, called the separation point ID, we would have a set, we would also would like to maintain a set of rules that tell us for this separation point ID or the name that we are, are targeting for that separation of concerns. Here are the set of rules that need to be dynamically evaluated during runtime based on certain variables that are locally um, or globally available or locally available, etc. at that point. For example, in MB45 AFCC, we have XVBAC, XVBAP, and all those kind of variables that are locally available. It's not declared, but it is still available if you go into debugger and find uh, and, and check it out. So there may be a set of rules that we want to configure where, which says, hey, if XVBAC uh, and sales order type is so and so, then we would like to give ownership on the flow control to team AA or to team ZZ, etc. So these are, it needs to be maintainable in a very easy way. If we, if we make the rule maintenance extremely complex, then that, that defeats the purpose and it becomes error prone as well. So there are complex rules, but we also need a way in which we can easily maintain it. And one of the ways we usually use it use for hierarchical maintenance is cluster views. So we will see it in the system as we jump into the system and see our data ta database tables and how we organize some complex database tables and make it easy to maintain using cluster view through a hierarchy. Now, rule maintenance is what, only one part of it. <clears throat> the second part of it is how would we 
access these rules and put the logic together in a nice package way instead of each consumer going to the tables and evaluating it directly. And that's where the rule evaluation API comes into picture. So as we jump into the system in a short while, we'll also look at the code which evaluates these complex rules and churns out a separation point filter ID, after which we can use that filter ID to identify where to route the call. We'll also look at, so this, so as I mentioned in the beginning, there will be two demos. The first one, we will simply touch on these filter ID or the identification portion of which team owns what kind of thing. In the second demo, we'll go one step further and then see how we use this filter ID or this ownership ID to route the call using standard SAP BADI, a custom BADI, not standard SAP, a custom BADI that we have, uh, have created. Uh, we'll use that to, to route the call using the custom BADI framework that SAP provides out of the box. And using the filter criteria, we'll route it into appropriate classes, which the classes are the owner are owned by individual uh, teams. So they don't have to touch the common code point or like MV45 AFCC. Um, so that is the separation handler. So some terminologies, mm -hmm. uh, some terminologies, a rules engine, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a, it's a combination of all these rules and the evaluation of these complex rules. And we'll see what these rules are and how complex it can go, et cetera, very soon. But it also has an API that exposes interaction with this rule. Uh, one of the things that we recommend would be to name, remember we talked about naming this separation point or, or these separation of concerns points we would recommend that the separation point ID be, <clears throat> it can be any string, but it will be useful if it is the user exit name or an easily identifiable you know, information. Um, the separation handler, separation handler is the, is the actual logic <clears throat> which will be executed, <clears throat> excuse me, which will be executed once this, the rule engine identifies the ownership of that particular uh, execution. So if a sales order is getting created and the sales order type is AA, the separation handler is any code that handles the, the fact that the sales order being created is AA and it needs to route it into the AA team's ownership. We'll, we'll look at this example using S flight demo, where we would be looking at different carriers, et cetera. And hopefully at that point, what we, I'm talking about in a very generic way here will become more solidified. The entire thing, the rules engine and the separation handler combined, that's what we terminology as separation framework. So separation framework is a combination of the rules engine, which is the brains or, or the logic, which or a generic logic, which evaluates dynamically the local variables and many other things, whatever we configure, makes sense out of it during runtime, and then evaluates that and brings out what ownership or who is the owner of this particular execution. And then the separation handler handles that ownership, takes that ownership information and routes the call to the appropriate team so that they can focus on their own uh, implementation as opposed to worrying about whether they inadvertently, uh, the code changes inadvertently break somebody else's execution and things like that. So with that, let's jump into the system and start seeing the different parts of this thing called the isolation framework that we heavily use inside Microsoft. I have here a, uh, a Docker system so I would, I'm, I'm not in a Microsoft system here. I have a Docker, I'm running a local uh, system here in Docker. And so the example that we see will be using S flight as the demo uh, for, the, for our demo. Now, to, st um, to start with, I wanted to show certain database tables that we 
you know, what we are talking about first would be these rule maintenance. Obviously, for rule maintain or sorry, rule maintenance and rules database. Actually, this is what we are going to see now. The rules database obviously needs some place to sit and 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 get stored, right? And that database tables we have actually three database tables. So at the top level, as I mentioned here, there is a separation point ID. This is nothing but a name, any name that we can give. We can name this MV45 AFZZ, for example, to indicate that the separation point that we are talking about is MV45 AFCC, the exit point, the user exit point. Or I can even name that Hello Gopal. It's based on the best practice that you can define at your organization or Microsoft. In Microsoft, we recommend that the separation point ID be the same as the user exit or the exit point where it is being used. A separation point ID can have multiple <clears throat> outcomes or filter IDs. What do I mean by this? So to go back to our example, the sales order creation, right? MV45 AFCC, that exit is one, but that very same exit can be executed by sales order type AA or sales order type ZZ, as we discussed earlier. So the filter ID would be two here. One is for AA and another for ZZ. If we look at the key, we have the separation point ID and filter ID com as combined as the key. And hence, there can be multiple filter IDs defined for the same separation point ID. There are some additional metadata like description, etc. And then there is priority and inactive. We'll see these in action very soon. So this is the highest level of our rule, the database that we were talking about, how we are thinking of storing the rule. So first, at the highest level, we are specifying what is the point of separation. We are naming it. <clears throat> we are also saying, here are the different possibilities of the rules that we are going to define. In our case, sales order type AA, ZZ, and tomorrow, if there is a GG or a YY as a sales order type, we would come and create new entries here through configuration. So that's our highest level. Now think about one level down in the hierarchy, and that is the rule set. A rule set are a number of bunch of rules that we are going to see next, which any one of those rule sets, if it evaluates to a true condition, then that rule set qualifies the highest level of, of, of separation, the, the filter ID that we talked about. Now, we'll, we'll soon see the hierarchy, and hopefully at that point, it'll be, make much more uh, sense. So I just wanted to show the database here. So the rule set, is one level down the hierarchy of the separation point specification. So we have the separation point filter ID and then the rule set ID, which then gets evaluated. A rule set holds a bunch of rules, which is what is stored in this table with this uh, specification where the separation point ID, filter ID, rule set, and then the fields uh, that gets evaluated. Now. Looking at these individual tables, it's pretty hard, right? Like, you know, to maintain each one of them and it is error prone um, where you, you define the filters in one table and then you come to the next table, uh, you know, maintain the very same thing over and over and then rules, you maintain the same uh, separation point, filter ID, rule set ID, et cetera, again and again. It's extremely difficult and error prone. But at the same time, these three tables work together. They are a hierarchy. And hence, we can take advantage of view clusters in SAP to organize this and make it a user-friendly, easy to maintain configuration entry. Let's see how we can do that. So I'm going to switch. So these, there are these, these are the core tables I wanted to show you first. But let's now switch to, um, to a cluster view 
So I'm in transaction SE54. I go to edit view cluster and provide the view cluster name. So here, the views, uh, there are views attached to that database table, simple basic maintenance views. These views are built in a hierarchy as we can see here in positions one, two, and three. Here we can define a hierarchy. We can also define the dependency. At the top level for position one, we specify the dependency as R, which means that it is a header entry. We then have also S, which means that it is a dependent entry for one higher level. So after all these, and then there are field dependencies, if there are, there is more interest in how to work and, and, and create complex cluster view, please in, in, our, uh, in, in, in whichever medium you are viewing this, provide comments and like feedback, and then we can, uh, we can work towards like, you know, creating tutorials or blog posts and those kind of things. But view cluster is a proven way in which we can weave together complex hierarchical structures and then get it into a nice user-friendly, easy to maintain configuration entries. So with all this set, like views clusters and, and, and the different views being connected and positions and things like that. Let's take a look at how this eventually, once it is generated, once the view cluster is fully generated, how it looks, right? So we have attached a transaction to the view cluster. This is how eventually after that view cluster configuration that we, have, we just saw eventually looks. So at the highest level, we have an identifier. We have a rule set, which is in the hierarchy. So the second level of the hierarchy. And then after that, there are rules. So let's take a quick look at one of the rules, uh, which will then segue into one of our demos. So in the simple demo, so which is the highest level, we are defining a scenario and I'm naming a filter fill one. What does it mean? What, what should be, when should this filter one be determined as the execution flow? That is what we'll be defined, we'll start to define in the next level of the hierarchy, which is defined rule set. So with, with this selected, I'm going into define rule set where I'm naming a rule set, a generic name. I just felt like naming it RS1, but best practice would be to have some more meaningful information or rule set ID. So I just named rule set ID one, and then drilling down the hierarchy one more level, I'm saying that there is a structure, if there is a structure called S flight underscore data in the program from which this API is invoked. So I don't have any information now. It's not hard coded or anything like that. This is basically saying the structure name, whatever the structure name is called, dynamically go and grab that structure during runtime and then evaluate a field called care ID. If that care ID field is GN and that, that condition is satisfied, then and only then should the filter ID be returned as fill one. If it is not, then this fill one is not the filter. We will go ahead and evaluate the next condition in the set, which is fill two. Let's see this again, rule set. Again, I have another uh, uh, rule set ID. And this time, if the carrier ID is NG, for example, then the filter ID is determined as fill two. So with this simple demo, let's see this in action with a debug point, right? Okay, I'm switching to ADT. Have a very, and, and by the way, if we make things very complex to call and the API to complex to access, et cetera, it becomes again counterproductive. So it should be a pretty straightforward uh, way of accessing it. So let's see how to access this API, and then we'll go deeper into how this dynamic coding and dynamic uh, evaluation is happening. Here, in this report program, 
I have defined a variable called S flight data, right? So think of this in, in the user exit context or baddy context, et cetera, that, that where we eventually really use this as the available variables or the context variables for you. For example, XV back. That's a variable that is available for you when the user exit is fired or the baddie is fired, et cetera, right? So if you put a breakpoint, you can see that there is a global variable called XV back or XV back, et cetera. So think of this variable. So for demonstration purposes, I just defined it here, but in a actual user exit, you will have those variables already available for you. So I am kind of for now, for the simple demo, I'm kind of hard coding this, uh, this variable, and then handing over the determination of what the filter ID is or the separation point ID is to this API. This is our, uh, our uh, API call. Remember in our discussion, the second pillar is the rule evaluation API. This rule evaluation API is nothing but a class that takes in the separation point ID and then churns out the filter ID. So we are going to hand it over to that separation point ID with the name that we chose as the separation point. So in this case, I just chose the name as simple demo and the configurations that we saw earlier here is using that configuration. That's what ties these two together. So I named the separation point ID as simple demo and that is the separation point configuration or logic that I'd like to invoke. And that's what we have uh, put here. Um, all right. So after that, we then invoke the API to resolve the filter. This is the code or line where the execution flow would go and dynamically grab from this program. Remember, this is a completely separate uh, class, completely separate. It's not even in the same package. It's, it's a completely different uh, object, right? So when evaluating, what we have done in that configuration is we have said that the calling program has a variable called as flight data. Now go grab this S flight data during runtime or the variable during runtime and it, it potentially has a field name called care ID and evaluate whether the S flight data dash care ID has the value GN. And if yes, then determine the filter ID as fill one, right? So that's what we have said. And this line, line number 14 is what it actually hands over the control to the framework, the API, and it then evaluates all the variables, et cetera. Notice that in line 13 here, we are instantiating the API, the separation point framework or the API, but please notice that there are no transfer of variables here because the variables that we want to evaluate may be different from one place to another. In MV45 AFCC, we may want to evaluate, say, five variables. In some other exit points, the, the variables types and the, the, the number of variables may be very different. So we cannot kind of like lock in and say, okay, here are the set of variables that we'll always be utilizing. It needs to be dynamic, right? So in S flight, so in this demo, I'm using this S flight data. And in the next demo, we'll see that it is a completely set a different, uh, different type of data. So notice that there is no data that is actually being passed, but it is going to use, the API is going to use the context that is available uh, and reach into the call stack to grab the data that it needs based on the configuration. So this resolve filter method goes ahead, does all that, and we'll jump into that, that, that code very soon, and then comes back with the filter ID. For now, let's wor not worry about the handler. I am going to execute this and then let's see what happens for the GN. If our configurations were, uh, were obeyed, when we have this rule set RS1 and we have specified that when S flight data car ID is GN, then the filter that needs to be returned is fill one. 
So let's see whether that actually happens. So I'm going to go ahead and execute this. So we have the breakpoint. So we see that the S flight data, the, the CAR ID is GN. That is our only evaluation criteria. So for now, ignoring all the other fields. So I'm going to step over. So at this point, this object has been instantiated. And watch what happens. Without, we haven't even passed S flight data or CAR ID, et cetera, into the framework. We simply instantiated it with the name. Watch what happens for the filter ID. Right now, filter ID is empty. And the moment I execute this, the filter ID is going to be evaluated to fill one. Why? Because we have specified in our configuration that if the CAR ID is GN, then the result it should be filter ID. So now let's go ahead and execute this one more time. This time, I'm going to change the variable in the program to ng, right? So I haven't changed the, con we, uh, we already have a configuration which uh, evaluate this context data of ng to fill two. And in the next part of our demo, we'll be seeing how this filter is getting used actually. But right now I just want to keep it simple. So uh, we are going to execute this. One more time. So I'm going to step through. Again, the object, the API is instantiated. Right now, the filter ID value is empty. Now, when we evaluate this, the filter ID this time is getting returned as fill2 because our rule that we have configured, this rule is what now gets gets evaluated to true because S flight data care ID is now NG as we saw. Um, this kind of gives an idea of, okay, something is happening where we are instantiating an API and then some variable like filter ID is coming back based on certain configuration. What do we do with it? What, is, what does it all mean? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, a, is it a, like a gimmick where we pass something and then we get back something and then we put a breakpoint what do we do with it, right? This is where let's go a little bit deeper into what we do with it using baddies as as the 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 uh, powerhouse of how to route the logic. So let's go to our next demo code. For that, I'm going to go back into SAP GUI. Oh, before before we go there. Um, I like to let's let's look at the the logic that made this filter come out right so i'm i'm going to go open this class this is the api the key method that that resolves the filter which which grabs all the data that we configuration data that we have stored and then then evaluate is this method called resolve filter so here as you can see there is a a good amount of dynamic programming, which grabs the context data from the call stack program. So first, at the at the initial stage, what we would we would do is to grab the call stack to see from where the call is coming. So as we know, at any point of time, at the top of the call stack, our current class will be present. But one minus the current class will be from where this call stack is or the call has been uh, generated. Right. So we are going to grab that caller and then we are going to evaluate each of the rules the key point here is based on the configuration table that we saw earlier based on the variable name and the component name we are going to grab the memory location where grab from the memory location the actual value from the caller from uh, the caller context, we are going to grab that data, which is the, the, that is what is happening in line number 212 to 215, where we are actually dynamically grabbing, actually 222, 
where we are dynamically grabbing the field content to this FS target field type. So we then go hop into the source scholars memory location, grab the value. And from there, once we have, have grabbed the value, we then compare it with our configuration that we have maintained. And then if it matches, the filter comes out. So uh, that's how there is some level of dynamic programming here, which then allows us to grab the context variables from the global available stack and then evaluate the filter. So with that said, let's see how we are going to use this filter, right? So to that end, <clears throat> um, okay. So to that end, I have a second demo here, where in this program, I'm simply putting a carrier ID on a carrier URL. Let's also look at the configuration where we have certain demo with baddie is the choice the, the separation point id that i chose to name it right and we have these different carriers aa ab co continental airlines united airlines etc so as you probably guess the rule for aa rule set for aa are there are two rules that any of these evaluates to prove would tell us that this is an american airlines flight one is by id and what is the rule SCAR variable car ID is AA. So here there is another variable called SCAR variable. This is the variable I would like to use to do that complex if else or evaluation criteria, right? So I name that variable and then carrier ID, if it is AA, then the filter ID is AA or by URL. So any one of these evaluates to true, then the filter ID is determined as AA. So let's execute this program. And I'm going to provide the airline's ID as AA and execute this. I do get this American Airlines headquarters, Fort Worth, USA CEO, Doug Parker. How did it get there? So this, we that we go and grab, we, we give control to the split framework and get the filter ID. I also have a baddie that is defined, a custom baddie, if we look at the custom baddie here, where I have defined a filter isolation point ID, it is car like. And then if we look at the implementations, there are multiple implementations for it for each of these airlines. And here we have defined the filter value that where did we get this filter value from? from the determination of the dynamic rule, right? We took that dynamic, we, we handed over to dynamic rule. Dynamic rule gave us back a, a unique identifier which tells us which path to take. We then utilize the standard baddy capabilities out of the box, baddy capabilities of SAP to, use, to hand over the execution or route the execution using the filter value. And then the implementation class when filter value is AA, the implementation class get flight info provides us with this American Airlines as the, the, the content. Now, so if I so there is AB Air Berlin, uh, Continental Airlines, right, United Airlines, all these different baddies. So let's take another uh, quick look at another execution time. Uh, so I'm going to run this program again. If I say A, B, Air Berlin, we have this. Continental Airlines, we have this. And United Airlines, we finally have this in headquarters. I'm sure many of you know that Continental Airlines is no longer there, right? So there is this, con let's assume that there is Continental Airlines team who is handling all the Continental Airlines operations right now. And there is United Airlines team, a completely separate team who is handling all the United Airlines operations. You probably know that Continental Airlines was bought over by United Airlines. So in the traditional way, um, in the traditional way, we would have to go back into the ABAP code, 
we have to make a lot of complex code modification to reflect the fact that Continental Airlines is no longer there. But whenever Continental Airlines, as the airline ID is put, United Airlines should be taking charge of it, right? Not anymore. Let's see how a simple configuration change in our rule set will reflect this. So I wanted to repeat this. If we put Continental Airlines or Airlines code here, look, I mean, watch that we are getting Continental Airlines information as the output. So let's make some simple changes. So first and foremost, the framework provides us with the ability to completely deactivate or, or say that the Continental Airlines does not even exist anymore. So for that, doing that, one of the options would be I'm going to go and then make this rule inactive. But doing this, if I now execute this, nothing is going to come back, right? So uh, no rules are now matching and hence no routing has, is happening through the baddie that we just uh, earlier saw. In addition to this, I want to onboard this Continental Airlines into United Airlines. To do that, I'm going to go into the rule set. I'm going to create some new entries which says, based on Continental Airlines takeover, right? Um, takeover. So for um, S car variable, carrier ID, if it is Continental Airlines, then also evaluate the filter to United Airlines. So that's what we are specifying just through configuration. Um, all right, so here, now let's go ahead and execute this program one more time. This time again with Continental Airlines, if I execute this, that filter criteria that we, we, we disabled, and again, just through configuration, there is no, there was no code changes to reevaluate the, the routing and ownership and things like that. Rather, we simply made configuration change to the rules, and then it now successfully routed to United Airlines, completing the merger in SAP as the, as the code execution kind of flowed to United Airlines team, as opposed to the previous um, you know, uh, Continental Airlines team, which no longer exists because United Airlines um, acquired Continental Airlines. We are out of time. You know, at some point we um, would like to uh, speak and if there are any questions or in the speaker session or speaker, meet the speaker session, if there are any questions, would be happy to answer them on how we utilize it internally heavily uh, to route complex business scenarios. But for now, Tobias, back to you.